Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today, one of my more um, anticipated guests, highly anticipated guests that I've been looking forward to is Dr. Jason Reza Giorgiani, author of Prometheism, Iranian Leviathan, and plenty other books. Check them out on Amazon if you haven't yet. And uh, welcome. Thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to be with you, Neil. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure as well. And uh, I want to get into the history of Mithra. Mithra is sort of an interesting character, sort of a mediator. But, uh, you know, I have a copy of an English version, an English translation of the Vedas, and I have the Mahabharata, and I have some of those uh, Indian epics. And there's Mithra in there too. Mithra is in Persian history, Mithra is in Roman mythology. Mithra is everywhere. So, where does Mithra come from? Where is the old, what's the oldest extent version of Mithra that we have? Well, uh, I think the oldest inscription that refers to Mithra is from about 1700 BC. And it's an interesting inscription because uh, basically it's in Sanskrit, but it was found in northern Iraq. And this is uh, one, of, one of a number of pieces of evidence for the fact that the Aryans came to India from elsewhere. Uh, so it seems that, um, you know, northern Iraq, which historically is Kurdistan, in other words, it's the Kurdish part of Iran, uh, was a homeland for those Aryans who eventually settled in northern India and, you know, who are loosely known as the Hindus in you know, um, Western discourse, uh, because they settled, you know, around the Indus River. And so it seems that the worship of Mithra was brought to northern India by these people who called themselves Arya, uh, the, the nobles. Um, and Mithra is actually one of the oldest of the Sanskrit gods. You know, uh, you have basically um, a... I wouldn't call it a trinity exactly, but you have three major figures in the oldest strata of Vedic religion, uh, Indra, Mitra, and Varuna. And Mitra, Varuna are sometimes hyphenated. They're referred to yes. together, right? And we can get that, you know, in greater depth and length because it turns out to be relevant to the feminine aspect of Mithra, which uh, eventually is split off as an independent deity. That's fascinating because I see the, the Mitra Varuna, like you said, hyphenated, and it's always a depiction of a man on this like snake body thing. And a, I've heard, I don't know how true this is, I mean, you could probably clarify this. Is that, a, uh, it's sort of like a depiction of the Milky Way galaxy or the Milky Way in the sky. And like those, I guess there's like this big giant star in the middle. Where that was, so I guess that's like a depiction of Mithra. I don't know if that if that's true or not. What do you? What is that? I think in terms of the snake, it's a Typhonian kind of reference to uh, Varuna as a storm uh, goddess type figure. And um, eventually, what happens is that uh, Varuna gets split off of Mitra and becomes the goddess that the Iranians refer to as Anahita. Uh, but, but to back up for a minute, the more important thing to grasp here, um, you know, before uh, endeavoring to understand anything else about Mithraism, is that Indra is a deva. Indra, Indra is the chief of the devas, the king of the gods, like Zeus, right? Mitra is a Ashura, or Titan. And so, Mitra Varuna, these are titanic figures. So, it's not that, you know... Uh, these figures, Indra and Mitra, were sort of like worshipped together. They're opposed to each other. They're the leading figures of two opposed pantheons, a pantheon of devas or gods and a pantheon of asuras. Um, and, you know, th this is also relevant to the eventual differentiation of a united Indo-Iranian community into Indians on the one hand and Iranians on the other, where the Iranians take the gods of the Hindus and they demonize them. And they worship the Titans instead, who are considered demonic by the Hindus. 
So Mitra winds up becoming the most important god to the Iranians, whereas from the Hindu perspective, he's a kind of demonic figure, uh, you know, in, in, a, you know um, in the discourse of the original Sanskrit Aryan religion, he's a uh, figure associated sort of with the hell, hellish realms and, you know, uh, the underworld and so forth. So th now you, this reminds me of Greek mythology. With the Titans and the uh, and what are the other um, the other ones are called the, the gods, I guess the or the Olympian gods. And Olympian, right, right, right. Yeah, I mean it, it shouldn't just remind you; it's the same thing. You know, the Greeks and the the uh, Indians and Iranians were all one people. They were a people called the Yamanaya um, or the Proto Indo Europeans, and they were basically centered around the Black Sea region and then migrated in every which direction, uh, some of them going into what became Greece, some of them going down into the Iranian plateau and settling there, and others going even further to the east and ultimately um, building a civilization in northern India. So this is fascinating. I was just going to ask you that. I was going to, you, you literally jumped in right before I was going to ask you, maybe there's a, a culture that they both come from, which makes sense, the Yamana, and I've heard of this Yamanana, uh, people that live around the Black Sea region uh, in between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. And there, I guess there is a giant flood there right around like, I don't know, 4,000, 5,000 BC. And so it forced everybody to sort of migrate in all these different directions. Some of them went down to Mediterranean. The other ones went down to the Indus. And uh, it kind of explains not only language, because linguists point to this all the time. Linguists are like, well, you know, the Sanskrit is very closely related to Germanic uh, nor, uh, these Nordic uh, languages and you can sort of see it like it's sort of like obvious that they all sort of come from one area and it's very and you, people think out of Africa and that's like the only thing people think about but really there was this huge culture and you like you said the Yamanana or however I, I probably pronounced it wrong and but yeah go ahead yeah the uh, recent um, more precise studies of population genetics also support this. It's very clear now that um, the migration patterns of the Indo-Europeans, uh, as, as they were hypothesized by linguists beginning in the 1700s, are fairly accurate. Now we have, you know, supporting evidence from genetics that shows that, you know, the Greeks, the Iranians, uh, the Italians also, um, and the Indians, you know, so for, all, all of the various European, Iranian, and Indic peoples come from a single origin, and that they basically migrated outwards from uh, the area north of the Black Sea, um, Ukraine, basically. Right. So, so then you get this sort of, this pantheon of our theology where there's, it's for some reason it's always centered around twelve. I don't know where that twelve comes from. Um, maybe you could touch on oh, that. Twelve well, constellations. Yeah, yeah. So you get the twelve constellations and um, Mithra, though Mithra seems to be the one name that stays where it's at. But I, I, I think Mithra's name changes in North mythology, but that's way later anyway. But um, my question is: Is Mithra a sun god? What is exactly is Mithra? You know, that's a damn good question, and it's not an easy one to answer, actually. Um, first of all, one thing we have to recognize is that anytime we discuss Mithraism, we're reconstructing a dead religion. And not only is it a dead religion, it's a religion that even in the time, you know, even in its heyday, was shrouded in secrecy and was, uh, you know, the most esoteric and occulted, probably, of the ancient um, or, or classical uh, religions. So it, it's very difficult to reconstruct uh, what exactly um, Mithraism consisted of. And then, of course, there's the question of the evolution of Mithraism from, you know, northern India to, you know, ancient Iran to late classical Rome and so forth, okay? Um, so throughout that whole evolutionary span, there are people who very closely associated Mithra with the sun. And... Some people even think that Mithra started out in the Sanskrit context as a sun god. 
But there's a Sanskrit sun god, uh, a Vedic sun god, Surya, which is a different figure. Right. And when you look carefully at the structure of the Mithraic myths in Iran, you see that Mithra is not the sun. Uh, Mithra is the solar charioteer or the bringer of the dawn. Which is interesting because, you know, we have a bringer of the dawn figure in the West, right? The light, exactly, the light that comes before the sun rises, the morning star. And so I think there's something to be said for an association between Mithra and Lucifer, especially because, again, going back to Mitra Varuna, Mitra is a kind of androgynous uh, figure or hermaphroditic kind of figure um, originally, which then gets split off into a male uh, emanation, as it were, and a female, you know, emanation. Uh, in other words, Mitra Varuna or later Mitra and Anahita in the Iranian context. But remember that in terms of the bringer of the dawn, you have also Lucifer and Venus, the morning star and the evening star, which are in fact the same entity. So, you know, I would suggest that uh, Mithra is not the sun. He, he's a solar deity, but he's, he's rather the bringer of the dawn. 